Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Classical Concerts from Quarantine. Um, let me just check the mic. Yeah, good. Fine. Um, yeah, everything seems a bit fraught today, but it shouldn't be. Well, as always, we're already well in advance, and then things happened, like an insistence that Tinto, our black cat, was carried into shot. So he's there now for you to enjoy. Um, Anna and Tiago are also here, two of our other housemates, so we've got a, quite a full room. It's rather lovely. Andy's here, and, and my darling Gabby, of course. Um, it's been a strange week, I think, for me anyway. The weather collapsing on Tuesday and the incessant rain, I think, constituted a, quite a big change of mood. Um, but everything became a little bit of a fug. Um, but then, yesterday, we had a lovely day as a house. Um, we made some pizza. The gluten-free aspects of the pizza being questionable in its delivery. Um, but everything tasting pretty good. And more importantly, the camaraderie and the fun that was had really helped my mood. We also did some play reading in the evening, which was an absolute delight. Um, today I've got some rather cool music, um, very different music as well. We're going to start with this work of Beethoven. Now, this is Opus 126, which one can already imagine is going to be quite late, but Opus 126 was actually the last opus of Beethoven's entire output um, for piano. And it's perhaps unusual that this constitutes six bagatelles. Beethoven we think of as this titan of the larger form, the more epic structure. And so it's unusual to see him in such light, light. <sighs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure lots of you will know one of his more famous bagatelles, Fur Elise. Um, and so he had written bagatelles previously, but this is the first time he'd written bagatelles to be put together to form one unit, one emotional and artistic arc. We have six of them here. Um, and like I say, they're very light, thoughtful, reflective work. He's making a big play for counterpoint, like so many composers going back to their roots in their later years. Um, but the way he uses counterpoint is very free from the constrictions that composers normally felt um, were placed on them. So, for example, very often he's using the two voices with the two hands at completely opposite ends of the piano, creating a really extraordinary sound world. Um, they're very different in mood. The first one, for example, is so comfortable, so easy, so light. Um, and but other ones, for example, number four, is much more rugged, much more energetic and muscular. There are some very cool effects. At one point he asks to hold the pedal down. Now the pedal is something that releases the dampers from the strings so that the strings never stop ringing. And by using the pedal you can then blend lots of different chords into each other. And so at the end of one of them he asks for us to keep the pedal held down for the last four bars. This produces an amazing mingling of sounds and harmonies. We mustn't of course forget that by this time he was pretty deaf. And in his later piano works, we often hear him go into these extraordinary otherworldly sounds. And many commentators have remarked that this could, have, could easily have been because of the kinds of ringing and the kinds of sounds that he was hearing in his head. Um, this is a piece for Guy, a student of mine, who, like the best of students, doing his best to test me and tax me, so not requesting anything simple that I could simply knock out something that I would have to take a lot of time over. Um, but it's been really nice for me to go down this, this journey of memory because I, I haven't played these since I was quite a young student. And obviously, I'm a very different person, a very different pianist now, and, and remembering how it felt then and mingling that with how it feels to do it now has been a very interesting process. Um, I think that's it. Enjoy. Bow for an Opus 26. One, two, six, bow yourselves.
Beethoven, a man of extremes, even within such largely tender miniatures. And I was thinking as I was playing that how so many of these great composers, as they get older and into their final years, their music becomes more distilled. There's never more notes than there were before. There are always fewer notes that seem to say more than, than was ever managed with the thousands and thousands of notes they wrote as younger composers. Uh, yeah, I always underestimate those works as well. I always I never quite appreciate them to be as gargantuan philosophically as they are until I'm in the middle of them and then it's like, wow, it's pretty cool. Okay, so that's nice actually because the, the last piece I'm going to play has some similarities in kind of, in lots of those ways with the Beethoven, so we can talk about that later. And for now, oh, I'm just a guy, miss you man. Um, thank you for everything you've given me. Uh, the best students are always the ones that teach you seemingly as much as you teach them. And you're always challenging me with your incredible tastes and, and talents in so many other musical areas. Um, I miss our hangs, so look forward to getting back to those when this is all over. Um, some Chopin. Some Chopin. This was a request by my aunt, Jean, and my uncle, Adrian, um, who I, I suppose are listening. Hey. Um, miss you guys. Um, look forward to the Christmas get-together. I, I can only tell myself that that's going to be allowed by then, otherwise things really will start to feel quite existential. Um, so yeah, Jean requested... Um, the seventh Chopin etude from the Opus 25 set. And, uh, and what a piece. I, I confess, I didn't really know it very well, never having opened the book at least to, to, to get through it, to play through it. Um, Chopin studies were tours de force for the piano. They were, as someone once told me rather nicely, they were more for the exhibition of technique rather than the improvement of technique as studies previously had been. They're just these incredible small works, normally each of them taking one technical difficulty on the piano. Um, and, but he creates such incredible music. These are not studies, these are not exercises in the way that we would previously have thought of them as. The seventh one acts a little bit like a slow movement, I think, in the middle of all the virtuosic chaos that goes on around it. Um, it's a rare example in, in a couple of ways for Chopin. First of all, we have a direct quotation of him, of another composer's music, which I imagine composers did all the time, but very, very subtly, so that most people who weren't them couldn't, wouldn't know quite how they'd woven in tiny little references. But this one is very obvious. The very beginning of the main melody is the same as the tune from Bellini's opera Norma uh, from an aria sung by the, the lead uh, called Terneri Terneri Figli, where she, at the beginning of the aria, she is contemplating, well, at the beginning of the scene, she's contemplating killing her own children because she is so tormented and distressed by the situation that they as a family unit find themselves in. And then in the course of this song, which as you can imagine is deeply melancholic, um, she talks about tenderly, tenderly, my, my tender, loving uh, children. Um, she realizes she can't do it. She can't kill them. Um, and this doesn't seem to bring her an awful amount of peace or respite. What Chopin does is he takes the soprano line, which starts quite low. Um, Bellini's is in D minor, and it starts here. Chopin brings it all down a semitone, feeling probably that C sharp minor was even more dark than D minor, which maybe is a little bit more veiled and bleak of a key. Um, but he, so he starts in the register, where, and when the, when the soprano starts, it's quite low in her range. You know, sopranos you'd normally expect to be operating up here. So Chopin kind of combats this by taking lots and lots more of the melody into this kind of register, far away from a soprano um, range. Uh, and the whole piece is really a left-hand tune. 
um, which is also very unusual for Chopin. He was highly influenced by opera and, and singers, and, and especially female opera and singers. And so he'd love to operate, you know, all the pieces I've played to you so far in previous weeks, you'll have heard him operating up here. People often refer to this study as the one with the cello tune, because he takes the soprano line so low that it could no longer be sung by a soprano, and instead we hear this kind of rich, warm, resonant sound. Um, Chopin was unbelievably so a piano composer. He wrote some songs, he wrote pretty much nothing orchestrally, and it's only when he writes for the piano that you feel like this is a true master in control of every aspect of the, of the creative process. And that said, at the beginning and end of his life, he did write for cello. He wrote an incredible polonaise at the beginning of his life, which is very light and flirty and playful. And at the end of his life, over 65, he writes his cello sonata. An unbelievable work and something that does show a clear resonating with him for the cello and for the way to write for it and for the type of sounds it can make. So what we have here is a kind of cello piece, a, a left-hand melody dominates, but there is a right-hand melody too. Um, for the vast majority of this piece, this is uh, responding to the left hand. It's not leading the energy. It's commenting and reacting to the things the left hand is saying. For the, is saying. For the middle section, the right hand leads, and the left hand plays a kind of repeated pattern that then doesn't change, and so starts to leave us feeling quite unsettled before the left hand returns to dominate um, in the end. Um, thank you, Jean, for recommending this, requesting this, because otherwise I probably wouldn't have um, come to it at this time. Um, and when I've been feeling kind of sad earlier this week, this has been a really uh, cathartic piece to be able to pour my soul into. <laughs> Hope you all enjoy it. Oh, and it starts with this very cool cadenza down here with no harmony, just these sparse, searching uh, notes that kind of seem to ask way more questions than they answer. And then the voice enters, and we're in the midst of the, of the anguish.
today. Um, yeah, talk about a lot of emotion packed into like five and a half minutes. It's pretty insane. Um, cool, some Brahms. Um, this was a request by Johnny. Um, I knew this piece a little, but uh, again, rather like the Chopin, it's just blown me away. In fact, the evening he requested it, we were on a Skype call, a uh, Zoom, Zoom call, uh, with another friend, and after the call, it was about midnight, and I just came in here, just thought, oh, I'll just have a little, a little waffle with his, with his recommendation and see, see what it's like. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty gobsmacked, really. The, the harmonic landscape is so unbelievable, given this is like 1893. You know, you can hear jazz starting. Um, the dissonance is, well, it's teeming with dissonance. Um, Brahms wrote to, of this to Schumann, to Clara Schumann, around the time, saying basically that this piece was intensely melancholy and to, to say that one should play it extremely slowly would not be sufficient. He also talked about, well, and then Clara replies talking about how she was delighting in the dissonance, delighting in the discords, and I can think of no better no better characterization, no better description, really. The piece is, is, very, is very melancholic, but a little bit like the Chopin. If you're feeling remotely melancholic or remotely sad, or you have the ability to access those emotions easily, and this music is intensely cathartic and wonderful to play, because you just feel like someone else gets it. And... And so, yes, every dissonance that you can taste, every harmonic grind um, feels really good. Um, it's not much of a melody, which is also pretty extraordinary. So not only do you hear the beginnings of, of jazz, but there's definitely kind of picture painting going on, seeing the sounds. Um, one can one can almost hear impressionistic music in this definitely the nicest description I've heard of this so far is that it was like light very slowly and gently filtering into a dark room um, I almost feel like this room is a bit overlit for this piece and I certainly feel like the day is too young for this piece this piece is at its peak when the sun has gone down um, we talked a little bit a couple of weeks ago about Brahms and why he might be melancholy. Um, he's to die in four years from the writing of this piece. This is his opus 119. So it's the last, like the Beethoven, it's the last piano works that he was going to write. Um, and we talked a lot about the word autumnal uh, two weeks ago and how Brahms at this time has this kind of weariness, this regret, this feeling of a life not not lived really to the full and 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 to that end he really is referring to love and his inability to have to find a partner to to create a a new a union between his soul and another um, and there are many reasons for his failure to do that but it's no doubt something that sat with him as in his lonely final few years and um, one hears all of that in this music um, Yeah, it's in three sections. Contrasting middle section shines a bit more light on affairs. Um, that's when the more kind of jazzy harmony, as I hear it, comes through. Um, but really just, what a piece. So thanks, Johnny, thinking of you, man. It's been really nice to, well, to only really meet you and start hanging out properly quite recently. And then, and then that was curtailed, obviously, but, uh, let this piece be a statement of intent for our future machinations.
sorry to uh, end on such melancholic notes, but hopefully the fresh lightness of the Beethoven was enough of a foil for those last two. Um, they certainly are what I need right now. So in that sense, I'm not sorry. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week. Um, please give some money to the NHS. Links are on the posts wherever you're watching. Um, and stay safe. I don't know when this will be over, but uh, music is, is giving me something to hang on to. Um, and yeah, I hope you're enjoying it. It means a lot that you join me for this. All the best. Enough for the